a simple mental exercise is if this guy has a wife, he needs to picture if his wife doing this to him would have stopped him. And ultimately, and unfortunately, the, the answer is probably no. The art of fighting without fighting? Show me some of it. Hi there everybody, Michael Valenti here with the School of Self-Defense in Indianapolis and in today's video I'm going to be reacting to TikTok self-defense. If you're new to this channel, be sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you know whenever we are coming out with a new video. The world of self-defense is filled with a lot of misinformation and the world of TikTok is filled with even more. So I ventured onto TikTok to see what happens when those two worlds combine. It took me very little time to find some techniques that gave me pause. To clarify where I'm coming from in this video, I've been in the martial arts world for 25 years with a focus on self-defense. I've been teaching self-defense since 2008 and I run my own self-defense school here in Indianapolis. More information about that in the description box down below. All I did for this video is I went to TikTok, typed in self-defense and saw what I could find. There is some good stuff out there and there's some bad stuff out there and I came across this video and I think this video has a little bit of both. So let's go ahead and break it down, look at the technique and talk about where it is awesome and talk about where maybe it is flawed. Let's go. Hey guys, it's Coach Tim with Independent MMA in Newton, Georgia. Today we're going to go over another, another push defense. We've already went over one when he pushes and I come on the inside and I start attacking the eyes with headbutts and stuff. So we're going to work a different one as he pushes. Cool. So his first defense that he showed, which he kind of mentioned, I assume this is one of his older videos, is to just deflect the push and go right in for the eyes. The benefit of that deflection that he's doing is that as opposed to meeting force with force, he redirects the force. The idea is not to ever meet someone's strength to strength because in a self-defense situation, you are very rarely at a strength advantage. And so as that push comes in by bringing his hands up, he simultaneously is protecting his face and deflecting that force past him, which allows him to feed directly into an eye strike. There's a lot of people who have issues with eye strikes in the world of self-defense. And honestly, it kind of stems from the fact that a lot of people use eye strikes in a very stupid places. Or even worse, they'll use eye strikes as some excuse not to actually train how to fight. Instead, think about eye strikes as an exclamation point or the cherry on top of your self-defense Sunday. You need to know how to actually fight and then you cheat. And so this initial thing he shows of kind of deflecting, bring the hands up, going right for the eyes, I think that's really good. I'm getting way off track because this technique is not even the one he's talking about. So let's, let's look at the technique that's to, for this video. That's that same principle that I was talking about. You saw that he didn't meet force with force. It takes the same amount of effort for him to turn against the push regardless of how hard his opponent is pushing. This technique may even be superior to the double deflection because now he's moving to what we call the outside line. If you imagine that there's a imaginary line running down the center of your body and projecting forward, we call that the center line. And you want your center line on your opponent and you want to get as as far off your opponent's center line as possible. So as you can see here, his opponent's center line is now facing this way and he's begun to navigate his way to the outside line while keeping his center line on his opponent. The benefit of this is when your center line is on an opponent, you have access to all of your major striking tools, your hands, elbows, knees, feet, headbutts if it's required. And the further off that line you get from the opponent, the more you restrict their arsenal. Not to mention that you don't really want to stand in punching range against somebody who's a lot bigger than you. So let's see where he goes from here. I'm going to turn. I'm going to make myself small. As almost all self-defense in any type of uh, martial arts, we always want to get to the outside of the elbow. So as he pushes, turn. I'm going to control here, guys. As I turn here and control, I'm loading up this hand for, for a big right hand. Okay, so, so he goes from a deflection into a 
punch. And there, I do take issues with this. So there's a video that I have out or is coming out. Not sure where this video is going to land in the timeline. Um, in which I kind of lay down what is required for good self-defense. And the last bullet point is it has to be non-size dependent. The issue with punching is that punching is very much a weight class thing. There's weight classes in boxing and MMA and kickboxing for a reason. And it's because the larger your opponent is in comparison to you or the larger size discrepancy there is between the two of you, the harder it is to just punch them and knock them out. So that motion you just saw there is a motion we call hip loading. And this is a really important principle. Um, it's in boxing, it's in kickboxing. I first learned it actually in the art of Kenpo. But the idea is if one motion turns your hip back, your hip is now loaded to throw a more powerful shot. Now he's choosing to throw, it kind of looks like he's throwing a hook or maybe even a haymaker punch, which I don't think is structurally the best punch to throw in this situation. I actually don't think a punch is the right answer in this situation because a punch is so size dependent. A simple mental exercise is if this guy has a wife, he needs to picture if his wife doing this to him would have stopped him. So if, if he pushed his wife and she turned and, and hit with a haymaker, would that be enough to stop him? And ultimately, and unfortunately, the, the answer is probably no. I'm also not a big fan of closed-fisted strikes to the head unless you've done a lot of conditioning for your hands. Okay, cool. So he's recommending that you move towards the back, something I agree with wholeheartedly here as well. Just like that centerline theory we were talking about, well, there couldn't be a better advantage than if I was completely behind my opponent. But what he's doing is perfect, is that you want to move to the back of your opponent. That's going to give you as much control as possible. That's going to allow you to either take the opponent to the ground, apply a choke, or even if you have a clear avenue to run, you may just go on a sprint. You also see here he's extending this arm. Now in my school we have a fun name for this technique. We call it singing in the rain. If you've ever watched the play then you know the move I'm talking about. But the idea is that as you go past your opponent you kind of allow your arm to catch on their body to use centrifugal force to kind of whip you around to get better control over them. This is a great technique for a smaller opponent because actually the more stable your opponent is, the more effectively you end up whipping around them. And if you're a lot bigger than them, lots of times that motion will just throw them to the ground. Okay, so so he, he's giving some options there. He says, if I get back there, I can either wrestle him or I can beat him up. And those are also, that, that's a good mindset because not all situations are going to require the same amount of force. And not all self-defense situations require you beat the crap out of somebody. Sometimes you just have to wrestle someone to the ground and have a conversation with them. Other times you just run the first chance you get. And then there are some times in which you actually would have to beat somebody up. Overall, this technique is pretty good. I'd probably give it like a eight or nine out of 10. I love the fact that he's not meeting force with force. I love the fact that he's using hip loading. He's coming offline and moving to the back. All of these are phenomenal tools. I can tell you this guy fights. This guy knows how to fight. The only issue I have with the technique is that the hip loading that he chose was a strike to the face, which I think is a little bit more of a size dependent technique, but he's already advocated for the eye strike so perhaps an eye strike maybe would work better in this situation or if you're going to throw a punch throw it into the body so that you aren't risking damaging your hand in the process of trying to defend yourself but other than the use of the punch which is probably more of an opinion thing anyways between the two of us this is a really awesome self-defense technique i like it a lot Oftentimes people will comment on my videos not having watched the whole thing. So to show me that you actually made it to the end, in your comment, incorporate the word star and you and I will know. Also, if you've made it to the end of the video, you're clearly enjoying this content. So go ahead and hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button and click the bell so you can get notified whenever I release a new video. 
And if you live in the Indianapolis area and you'd like to come train with me, all the information you need to get started is on our website, theschoolofselfdefense.com. And we've also opened up Zoom classes for people who can't get their way to my state. So if you want to train with me via Zoom, once again, that information is on theschoolofselfdefense.com. So until next time, everybody, I'm Michael Valenti with the School of Self-Defense. Fight on.